All right, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna let folks stream in. All right, we've got, welcome to uh, This Clinical Life. Uh, my name is Stephen Beeson. I am a family medicine physician, founder of Practicing Excellence. And you know, this, this is always the favorite part of my month, which is hanging out with amazing people. And not that we quantify amazingness because this is not a competition, but um, uh, we've got we've got an amazing uh, uh, amazing uh, guest with us today, my good friend General Mark Hurtling, uh, and I first became familiar with Mark when I read his book Growing Physician Leaders, which is a, a fantastic read if you haven't had a chance uh, to read it. And then my good friend uh, Sharpie Steely, colleague and uh, fellow hospitalist and. Uh, the hospitalist for practicing excellence, uh, Mark Shapiro, uh, knew Mark and had a chance to introduce us. And I have been a gigantic fan for a whole bunch of reasons uh, since then. So uh, Mark has not only uh, been a fantastic contributor to how, how do we better lead, uh, but he's also uh, dedicated his life to service to our country as a patriot and as a general commanding all of uh, Europe forces at one point. Uh, and uh, has has been part of our faculty at Practicing Excellence uh, to help uh, how do we lead in a way that uh, engages our people. So, Mark, welcome. Well, you know, this is great, Stephen, but I, I got to start off by telling you that you have really contributed to the passion in, that I now have in a second career, both you and Dr. Mark Shapiro, as well as Dr. Sheikha Jain and about 20 other different physicians uh, that have shown me that uh, physicians are a lot like soldiers. So I found a new home in the second career and it's it's been fun working with you all. Well, I think the, the, the string of pearls is, you know, how do we uh, engage and lead people to allow them to do extraordinary things that allow them to contribute to what we wanna do and become I, uh, under duress and difficulty and sometimes frank, frankly, life-threatening circumstances. So before I before we dive into questions, two two funny stories about Mark Hurtling. Uh oh, uh, yeah. here we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had a chance. Uh, Mark and I have had dinner on a couple of occasions uh, with some jalapeno margaritas, and you know yes. our, our favorite. Mm -hmm. So, but whenever you know when you go out with this guy, he's really recognized. Not only is he <laughs> what are you six six. Six, six five, four. yeah. Six, oh, six four. Six, anyway, don't, don't cause yeah. me to grow. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So he's a he's a tall uh, person, and uh, but obviously he's on television on CNN as a military analyst uh, almost every day. Um, so a lot of people recognize him. So when we go out, you know, I feel like I'm with a celebrity. That uh, General Hurtling, General, Hurtling, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. You know, shaking his hand, and so that's always uh, a little bit fun to ride those coattails. Uh, and the other thing is I had a conversation with a CMO just yesterday uh, who was a graduate of your course mm. uh, in developing leaders to engage people. Uh, and he spoke very personally about the transformative impact you had on him and how he approaches leadership uh, and also shared some of the data of uh, your leadership approaches and how it impacts people's willingness to participate in the organizational journey uh, with some really powerful uh, uh, impacts of uh, developing leaders. So uh, just a, a couple of... Yeah, I, I don't know if you want me to use his name, but I guess that was Dr. Lee Scheinbart. I guess mm -hmm. I just that did was, use that, his name. That, that was and, Lee, uh, and who's he, an amazing guy. So. He not only uh, truly enjoyed the course uh, as we introduced it at his hospital system, but last year he approached uh, to, to do some research on it to mm -hmm. see how, uh, how much of a change there was, not only in terms of leadership of the, the 50 individuals who were in the course, but also their affiliation with their hospital system, how, how they felt in terms of loyalty uh, to the hospital and how that changed during the seven month we had the course. And truthfully, I just saw the data too, and, and it's pretty compelling for sure. Uh, but I'm, he's very happy with it. And, uh, and I'm very happy that we were able to contribute that way to bring a bunch of individuals, doctors, nurses, and administrators to work as a team and to advance uh, their, their values of their system, as well as their care for their communities. 
So, you know, I think our, our general thesis and certainly what we're going to speak about is there is a way of leading that engages people that is transcendent across industries and different layers of an organization. And the question is, how do we dial in development of our people to display those high engagement behaviors across a clinical enterprise um, to execute all the imperatives before us? So um, anyway, so let's let's dive in a little bit. For those of you that don't know uh, the Mark Kirtling story and how you went from commanding U.S. Army Europe hmm. to developing healthcare leaders, those are two different places and different things. Yeah. <laughs> so talk a little bit about how that played out. Yeah, and I'll, so I'll, I'll mention story. very briefly what happened. Uh, and I'll make a very long story short, but I was commanding U.S. forces in Europe had had several tours in combat. And just by a coincidence, I went to a dinner one night um, at, at the embassy in, in Luxembourg. It was Memorial Day, and we were up there for a, a memorial cemetery uh, mm. uh, ceremony. And there were a couple people from a hospital system in Florida who were looking for a specific kind of person to start an initiative at the hospital. It had nothing to do with leadership. It had to do with something else. And they had been uh, told by an executive at Disney, who was their partner here in, our, in the Orlando area, that they needed to hire a retired general. And, uh, and, and they were surprised by that comment, but they asked the uh, Disney executive why that would be the case. And he explained to them the reasons why a retired general might be able to bring this initiative they were thinking about over the goal line. So they approached me, asked me if I was interested after they found out I was retiring in a couple of months. And I came to the hospital and, and realized their value system, what they were trying to do in this faith-based non, nonprofit hospital kind of aligned with my values. So I started working for them. Within a month, uh, you know, I, I made very good friends with their chief medical officer who had the office right next door to mine. And he would come in every once in a while and ask me leadership questions about physicians that were doing certain things and how do I get them to do better or how do we get them to be a part of our, of our decision-making process? So after talking about that for a while, he said, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, we've, we've hired a lot of universities and a lot of contractors to come and teach us leadership, but they don't really get the healthcare industry. Uh, they, they're, they're fine if they go to General Motors or Caterpillar Tractor or, you know, Swab or something like that, but healthcare is different. And he said, now that you've been in it for a while, you kind of understand it as an outsider and what we're trying to do. Could you teach physicians about leadership and how to be better leaders? That's where I'll end the story, uh, Stephen. That was in 2014. Wow. And over the next five or so years, uh, we had several classes a year. And looking back, in preparation for this uh, podcast with you, I kind of look back to see about how many people have graduated from the course I was teaching. And I, I was the one that designed the course and executed as the, the only instructor. We've had over 1,200 people in six different hospitals go through this course. And in each one, uh, I feel like uh, you know, it, it, I only taught them the basics, but what they learned from it was the courage to step up and lead, to put themselves in a position where they contributed more than they had before based on just a few tips that I gave them. Uh, and in fact, last night, this is funny, I, I, I'd forgotten about this. I could show you a, a text I got from a young woman who's a ED doc. And she mm -hmm. wrote me a text last night. She says, hey, Mark, it's been eight years since I graduated from the course. Thank you for making all of us a better leader. And those are the kind of things that just get you right in the heart. And you say, holy smokes, that was great. Um, wow. But anyway, that's that's but, my story. Well, you know, you continue to make a huge impact. And, and if you look at, you know, if you look at the data and the operations and the culture of organizations that are the top decile for people saying, I love working here. I'm willing to access my discretionary effort to help this place succeed by virtue of what it's done for me or, and, or patients saying, 
this is an amazing care team. Uh, I would drive further and make sure everybody I know, love and care about comes here for their care. Getting those two things to manifest, which is amazing for patients and amazing for care teams, requires highly effective leadership. Right? There, there's a way of leading that prompts people to exhibit the behaviors to allow those things to manifest. So one of my first questions is, uh, you know, you've become a, uh, a source for leading effectively to bring the best of others. Um, I would love to hear your commentary on the impact of how we lead on the culture of our organization and the experience of care teams, like oh. how we're showing up as leaders yeah. and the experience of care teams. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's really hard to put a metric on something like that. Because when, when you take a bunch of individuals and you say, hey, we want to train you on how to be a better leader, immediately, usually, the, the chief financial officers will say, how much is this going to cost? How much resources is this going to take? How much time is it going to take away from? You know, they look at the metrics. And, and sometimes you just can't say better leadership will provide better care, um, both at the individual dyad level, the, the, the physician to the patient, and at the organizational letter level, the physician is part of the care team making decisions on the future. But what, what's fascinating is there's more and more data now coming out, just like the, the, the conversation we just had. And, and my doctoral thesis was on physician leadership in the healthcare industry. And it, it, there's an indicator that better organizations come when leaders are trained and really find ways to grow and learn about how to interact better with people. You know, this, you take an MBA course as an example, and I teach an MBA course at a local college, teach strategic leadership. MBAs are all about processes and systems, but leadership is all about how do you interact with people in a positive way to achieve accomplishments, to reach your objectives, to, to set a goal and a vision toward a goal and then reach that. That's a whole lot harder than just putting systems in place. And truthfully, in any organization, and you know this more than most, Stephen, you got to have both. You got to have the ability to manage, but you also have to have the ability to lead. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't pay as much attention to the leading as they do to the managing. Right. What, what's interesting to me is, and, and certainly probably the experience of many people on the podcast right now, is that we're struggling with engagement. Uh, engagement levels, uh, the most recent data is in the low 20s. Uh, you know, we define engagement as, uh, I'm going to stay here. I would recommend this place to others. I will access my discretionary effort. I will use my influence to advocate for what we want to become as an organization. And this place where I work is everything I hoped it to be. That's you know, sort of five diagnostic criteria. Right. Of engagement. And I'm curious, you know, in all of your sort of looking at leadership and its influence on engagement, if it, not to prompt you to oversimplify, but what are the most important leader actions that you found to be powerful in engaging people where they stay and they participate and they become enthusiastic, enthusiastic and contributory to what the organization wants to become. Yeah, what are those leader actions from I, your I'm going to surprise you to say that it is relatively easy. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes the easiest things, uh, or as Clausewitz once said, everything in war is simple, but the simplest things are difficult. Well, everything in leadership is easy but the easiest things are also difficult. It's, it's caring about others. It's understanding that people want to contribute. Uh, and you just got to ensure that what is inside of you as a motivator is something that I understand and I can influence those motivations for a greater good across the organization. It's allowing people to see, first of all, that they're valued for their contribution, but also that there's an opportunity to learn and grow every day too. Um, 
you know, I, I could tell so many stories and I do, as you well know, but, but one of the things when I, when I decided at the ripe old age of 63 to go up and get a doctorate, I had a mentor, a student mentor who I said, what's, you know, I've, I'm going to look at leadership in this program as part of the doctoral thesis. I said, you know, I've spent a career doing leadership. I said, what am I going to get out of this, this school of higher education? And she said, Mark, she said, you're going to learn how much you don't know. And having that openness to learning something new every day and to try and understand our fellow human beings and what motivates them and how we can influence that motivation all boils down to, first of all, caring about our fellow human beings, whether they're a colleague or a patient, uh, but also understanding their values. What do they believe in? Why are they living life? What are the behaviors that they exhibit that, that, that tells them that you know, they're contributing to something bigger than themselves? And, and truthfully, Stephen, that's the recurring theme in every organization. If there's a dictatorial leader who's demanding things or directing things and not listening to his or her team, uh, and you put that up against a someone who understands how others can contribute and really draw that out of them and get the best out of their people, man, the organizations, you can smell it when you walk in. It's, it's palpable. You know, what's really interesting, and it's a bit of a paradox, is that as the pressure to achieve organizational objectives increases, the probability of grabbing command and control also increases. And the less likely it is under those conditions to access the discretionary effort to achieve the objectives. Yeah. So um, it's, it's the fear of failure. And yeah. You don't want to fail as the organizational leader, whatever that organization is. So there is a tendency, if you're not comfortable with your people, to try and take control and allow yourselves to do everything. Um, you know, there. It's it's fascinating because there there's a an entire study about this uh, in the military, truthfully, and, and and we do something in the military called mission command, and that is the ability to give enough direction to someone that they can go out and perform things in their own way, and it 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 really generates from something the Germans used in World War II called Aufstrad Taktik. How's my German for you there today? But now it's getting to the point where good organizations realize that you, you can't just have a laissez-faire approach where you allow people to do anything, but you can give them boundaries mm -hmm. and tell them to operate as maybe a, uh, a football coach would with a, a really good halfback saying, hey, you can do open field running as long as you stand, stay within the boundaries that I'm giving you. But my goal is to, for all of us to score the touchdown, uh, not to use a really overused sports analogy. But if you can get an organization to that point where you've trained them, where you've inspired them, where you've given them your vision and where you've communicated what you want to accomplish, it's amazing what people will do. One of the things... One of the things that I find uh, incredibly interesting, in fact, we had done a regional workshop on this. It was such a compelling, bright need on how it is that we lead our people to engage them uh, in you know, organizational uh, improvement efforts. And it was the subject that you're referring to now, which is uh, leader enablement. How do we enable people to actively participate towards an organizational intent. You know, if the organizational intent is kindness and compassion for every patient every time, allowing teams to innovate and create what that might look like where they are. Yeah. And, and as opposed to giving scripting and, you know, other, you know, other acronyms of go do this thing, which can be translated a, around leaders are telling me to go do something as opposed to giving me the authority agency and power to say, okay, I get the intention. We're trying to create a place where kindness and compassion for every patient, every time plays out. What might that look like here? 
and and that that agency and that innovation is is such a powerful driver it, it, of engagement. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Even the way I mean, even the way leaders frame questions, like you just said, you know, it's it's one thing to have a huddle with your team, and, and we tried to work an exercise with a bunch of our physicians on this of that huddling, what you all call rounding in some cases, is usually very directive. And it's some, you know, the, the, the head physician is sometimes hesitant to take input from other people. And you can tell that just in terms of the way they ask questions. Uh, so, you know, certainly there are times for directions from the, the lead physicians, but sometimes there's time to, to, to really just say, what do you think about this? What, what do you, gee, nurse, you know, Smith, what do you think is going on that, that I may be missing? Man, the empowerment, like you just said, to, to open up to a physician by a nurse to, to really give something uh, is critically important. And one thing I'll say on that, Stephen, is leaders sometimes don't understand how intimidating they are. And whenever you're in a leadership position, you intimidate others. So getting past that intimidation uh, is critically important to opening up that dialogue and letting people feel like they need they can be a, a bigger part of the team. There was a there's a great book that I've spoken about frequently uh, that uh, approaches this topic by Liz Wiseman called Multipliers, and it speaks about leaders that multiply the impact of their people and those leaders that diminish the impact of their people. And her data shows that you the the degree of intelligence and contribution to the group mission is 2.5x higher when people lead with multiplying leadership. And multiplying yeah. leadership is, again, is passing the power to for their teams to contribute ideas to pursue a well-understood intention. Uh, it is about having faith in the people that you lead. It's about harvesting their ideas. It's about expecting their best. Yeah, And as opposed to diminishing leaders, which is, micromanagement top down. And I think the, the, the diminishing leader will be the end of an organizational culture if they can't have a profile of all of our leaders must become multiplying leaders. If, 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 if our goal is to, is to retain our clinical talent, engage our clinical talent, and build, build organizational culture where people love coming to work, we have to have multipliers at every level uh and uh, anyway it, but it's so counterintuitive that that if we pass power to our front line somehow our organization is going to go into chaos yeah well you know, and, and i think that's thing. because there's there's a, a spectrum there you know when you pass power from to the front line it doesn't mean you then go back to the office and not do anything you know right. you still have to be engaged and i think there's a lot of people that think well gee passing power means that i can't um, you know, be a part of things anymore. I can't control things. No, it's just a matter of how you're a part of things in the future. You know, you, you let people roll uh, and, and let them experience ways to do things. And sometimes the great leaders have to also understand that they need to be there when their subordinates look like they're about to fail and they pull them out of that before they fail and, and really help. One of the challenges I want to ask you about is uh, that the leadership skills to engage people are important at every level. And engagement is a bit of a local phenomenon, right? It's, it's my direct manager. And it is the managers that are least developed, most overwhelmed, most exhausted, most burned out. So you meet with the executive team who is working on their skills of growth mindset, multiplier leadership, compassionate leadership, low authority gradients, harvesting ideas, uh, and all the things that engage people. We know what the registry of highly effective leaders do, but, but cascading that composite of leadership skills from you know, director, senior leader, and getting that happening at the front line, at the manager level, what do you suggest to healthcare participants and fellow leaders on how do we get the composite of highly effective engaging leadership to occur at the manager level where it's 
vitally important. Yeah, um, a couple of things on that. I'll, I'll say, first of all, that there, there is a concept that, uh, in fact, there's been a couple of books written on the, the, the concept of followership. And, and I've read two of the most popular ones. And truthfully, I don't see it as followership at all. What the authors are talking about is more informal leadership. How do the subordinate members of the team contribute to the objectives of the senior team members? It's, it's not that they're just continuously taking directions and contributing to what that senior person wants. It's how do I fit in and help my boss or my leader accomplish the things in the most effective and efficient way? What's my role in that? So when you're talking about managers at a, at a subordinate level that are overwhelmed and overworked, you know, just the term, in my view, the term manager is, is somewhat toxic. Uh, you know, it, it, every member of a healthcare team is either a formal leader with their name on the door and a parking space outside and, you know, getting a paycheck for a specific thing, or they're an informal leader contributing to you know, healthcare at the organization. And I think just that approach takes on a different meaning. The second thing is, you know, I, I'll say this, is training. How, how what, what kind of time does that senior executive take in truly uh, training and teaching and counseling and just conversing with their subordinates so the vision becomes real? So, so those informal leaders within the organization, we'll call them managers for this, uh, for this conversation, truly understand what the leader wants, what the boss wants. And then they can say, ooh, I can contribute in X, Y, or Z way, and it, it'll be phenomenal. So there is that requirement of development, which by the way is in, in when I teach, that's one of the things we spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, I, I asked the physicians in the class to close their eyes and think about the person that was the most, uh, had the most effect on their career as a leader. And within a second, I say, okay, open your eyes. And what's fascinating is everyone has already decided who that person is. It's an aunt or an uncle or a coach or a colleague or some, someone that developed them, that held them to standards that had conversations with them, that taught them how to do things in a proper way, who showed them what right looked like. Those are the people that are the leaders. And what, what senior executives have to do beyond just running the organization and managing the organization, they have to grow the bench of the people who are gonna follow in their footsteps. Right. And the only way you can do that is <laughs> spend time with people. And that's, that's the hard thing about being a leader is it requires a lot of time. You know, one, one of the things that I, I find uh, fascinating is there is the concept of what we call leader cohesion. And leadership cohesion is there is a way of leading in our organization, meaning whatever position you are, formally or even informally, there's a composite of things that we do. It's like evidence-based care. There, there's just certain ways to manage heart failure and there's certain ways to manage post-operative DVT prophylaxis. There's care protocols that reduce the variance to optimize outcome based upon evidence, right? Mm -hmm. But the variance around how it is that we lead is massive. And we call that low leader cohesion. And I think you speak about the power of developing people and training people on the things that we know work uh, is, is such an important um, uh, investment. Uh, because if we want our managers to you know, influence people so they stay, they engage, they participate, and they contribute, and they love coming to work, uh, then, then, then everybody has to do the things that allow those things to manifest. Um, that wasn't really a question. Uh, was no, but, just, but if I can comment on what you just said, the, yeah. because you started off by talking about the metrics associated with the science of medicine. Mm. But what really builds cohesion is not only that 
effectiveness as a, let's call it a scientist, as a doctor, there also has to be the effectiveness of the art of leadership as well. So you, you know, in, in our professions, in both of our professions, as both a soldier and as a physician, there, there is a science to what we do, but there's also an art form. And to build cohesion, science is part of it because you're, if you're an incompetent doctor, your colleagues are gonna realize that very quickly and you're not gonna be a leader. But if you're an extremely competent doctor and you treat people poorly, or you don't return phone calls, or you do things that are contrary to the standards of, and practices of the organization, or they see in you that your values are not quite what they think they sh the subordinates think they should be. And by the way, your subordinates are always looking at you to determine what your values are. Then that, that decreases the effectiveness of the leader, no matter how good they are as a physician. Right. They've got to be good as a leader too. And that's, that's the part that I think I play a role in because I don't know jack about medicine. <laughs> but, but I think the combination of the two areas uh, are, are pretty fascinating to watch. You know, what's also, you know, fascinating to me is that, again, how we lead highly impacts the engagement of people. The engagement of people will impact our capacity to achieve objectives and our ability to keep and facilitate contributory team members is based upon how we lead at every layer of the organization and development is a key facilitator and catalyst to getting those things to happen. But what I, what I would also contend, and I want to be able to ask you about this, is leadership burnout is as high as any other demographic in healthcare. Yeah. And my personal experience and my, and there's some data that suggests this, although it's sparse, is that leading effectively to bring the best of those that you lead and to care about the people that you lead and to bring the best of them and watch them light up is deeply enriching as a leader. Yeah. So I would love your commentary and observations and any data that you know that <laughs> leading, leading well is restorative for a leader. Yeah, I don't know if this is a setup on your part, but uh, I'm smiling because I actually have a little experience with this. When I, when I did the doctoral thesis for a, a very large hospital in Illinois, uh, I was focused on proving my hypothesis as a doctoral student in this class and the pre and post test surveys and all the things that we were going to do. Well, the, the, uh, the CMO who was kind of driving the study for me, he said, hey, look, at our hospital, we've had three suicides in the last six months. And he says, I think we have a burnout problem. Uh, a resiliency problem is what he said. He said, could you include some questionnaires uh, or within your questionnaire, some questions about uh, burnout? And as a doctoral student, you never want to add more to your thesis or, or what you're researching, but because he asked me to do it, I did. I said, okay, I'll do this, but we'll just look at the data at the end and I won't make any conclusions. This will be outside the survey or outside the thesis and, and you and I will just talk about it. But what happened, Stephen, is I didn't talk, I didn't say the word burnout once. I never mentioned resiliency in the class. We just taught the basics of leadership in this six month long program. Well, as expected, all the leadership numbers had improved significantly. All the views of the colleagues that we ask about the people who are in the class improved significantly at the 001 level. But what was fascinating in, in all the people in the class, there was a decline in burnout, significant decline. And I had never mentioned it. We had never taught about it. We had never read books on it, but we saw a decline. And when I was discussing this with my advisor at my uh, university, her, by coincidence, this woman who was my advisor, has, her father was a doctor. And she said, I can tell you what that is. She said, what's happening is people are understanding how to care for each other, how to exhibit their values, and they're reminded why they got into the profession in the first place. It's to serve others. Because all the things that contribute to burnout are patients coming in with constant complaints, patients saying they read something on WebMD and you're wrong because you, you don't know what you're talking about, 
I need a, you know, it, it is the constant engagement with people who are hard to work with. That's one area that causes burnout. The other thing is just physical, emotional, and social fatigue, which doctors being a 24 seven profession experience. And especially during something like a COVID pandemic, when you're really thrown into a crisis and still doing the things you have to do. Um, but every once in a while, you have to back off, remind yourself, number one, why am I doing this? Number two, what are your values and what do you consider uh, ad adherent to your behaviors? What do you want to be perceived as doing? And number three, the goal that we serve as physicians or you serve as physicians, I served as a soldier, my fellow soldiers, and it can reduce the burnout. It can eliminate it, but it can certainly reduce that burnout of just feeling frustrated about our current state of, of where we are in the profession. It's funny, I had a, a conversation uh, with an old friend uh, uh, and that happens now as, you, as we passage through the life cycle. Um, and we had a, a conversation over a couple of hazy IPAs and talking about, you know, what makes for, you know, now that we've all been through a lot of things with family and friends and tragedies and triumphs and, you know, just the passage of the human experience and what is the best of this life. And it is all about our ability to make something else better. It could be with our children. It could be with our patients. Yeah. It can be with our colleagues. It can be a person on the street. It can be in a volunteer role. There, there is a basic fundamental human need to be able to make a damn difference in this world. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, we, we've deviated from that in our panic to jack revenue, diminish cost, and focus on the metrics that are proxies for the financial well-being of our organization. Right. Um, and leadership is an amazing opportunity to make a difference. And I'll tell you a quick story here about my son, uh, who's going through student teaching right now, getting his master's in education. And he called me uh, last night, in fact, and, you know, doing his student teaching. He's doing eighth grade and talked about what it was like to find students that struggled, uh, that are from difficult circumstances and listening to them and what they might need and what their literacy and what their levels were and to be able to take action to help and support them. Uh, and he, he just spoke with almost, uh, you know, a, a tear in his voice you could hear yeah. about what it felt like to be able to mentor, to guide, to help and that's essentially what leadership is. Yeah, you're making a difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but here's the fact, I'll, I'll, I'll put a warning to, to that, Stephen, and that's what uh, is, I think, sometimes contributes to our burnout. All of us, all of your colleagues in healthcare and all of mine in the military, we're all type A personalities. We want to do good. We want to do right in every situation and have that self-actualization moment where we say to ourselves, gee, I'm making a difference. But every once in a while, there's a failure. And, and as human beings, and especially as type A human beings, we tend to focus more on the failures than we focus on the successes. Uh, you know, that, that one person that we didn't get right in the healthcare situation or where we made a mistake, will compound the feeling about the hundred that, that you did something good for because you're focused on that individual. In combat, the, the, the soldier that was killed in action, is was that my mistake? Uh, and as, as a great Sergeant Major once told me, sir, it might've been, but imagine all the others that conducted their operations successfully and are all going home. Uh, and, and even though you can't, uh, you can't focus uh, on that. Uh, you have to keep it in your mind to always prove that you can do better. It is a driving force, but you can't let that overwhelm you. Well, and I also think part of our job as leadership is, and whether it be an informal 
leader in the endoscopy suite with your team or a formal chief medical officer, chief nursing executive helping to lead a large clinical enterprise, we have to make it safe to be able to raise your hand for help, right? Uh, to identify pre-harm, uh, and, and and that that too is a leadership skill. What do we say and do to create safety among our teams to raise their hand that 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 they're going off the rails and they need a little bit of help? Or in the spirit of safety culture, I I, I see something here that may represent a risk to the patient. Yeah, And, you know, if we say, gosh, we want to advance our safety culture and we want to reduce harm and we want to create uh, uh, durability in this really freaking hard clinical life that we all lead, then we as leaders, by virtue of being a, at the top of the authority gradient, know have to learn and deploy skills to create to create that safety, that good catch safety. And I got a flashing red light yeah. on my personal dashboard that... Yeah. I need some help. Uh, and those those are leadership skills, again, subject to training and and development. Yeah, two, um, two, two of the things that I learned from a great mentor of mine, uh, he said, you know, a, a leader has to, first of all, develop the skill of looking people in the eye and determining how they're feeling. Uh, and boy, that's that's a practiced art. And then the other thing he said was, a great leader asks the right questions. And, and when I probed on that, I said, what's the, the right question that you ask all the time? And this was when I was a young, uh, a young, young, much younger man. He said, the right question is always, what can I do to help you succeed? Hmm. What are the things you need from me that will make you perform better? He says, when you ask that question, it's amazing what kind of answers you get from the sublime to the ridiculous. And, and I've tried to practice that art uh, all through my career. And he was right, boy, you would get some, hey, you know, boss, if we did this, things would be 100% better and it would be something grand versus, well, gee, if I just had the ability to do that, you know, I'd be a lot happier in my job. And if you ask that question enough, you're gonna get a whole lot of answers and being able to, and, and you're able to improve the organization. Right. And I think it, you know, that is a leader skill as a leader tip, uh, sends a signal to those that we lead. I see you, I'm here to help. Right. And what can I do? And what can I learn about what you need to be able to execute our organizational, uh, intention? Yeah. Uh, uh, one final comment. I know we're, we're running out of time, um, that I think is really, really important. Um, sort of the, the soil that effective leadership uh, uh, grows from. And that is, and you've, and I've learned this as you've done this leading to engage program with us at Practicing yeah, Excellence. I keep watching your, your yeah, coaching yeah. tips. It's, it's all this stuff in a program. It's fantastic. So, but you speak about the power of organizational intention. intention. What do we aspire to be? It's the equivalent of take that hill, right? Yeah, You're yeah. going to figure out how to best take that hill, but knowing exactly what we aspire to become as our beacon on the hill allows leadership to be facilitators and catalysts with leadership skills at every layer to mobilize people to pursue that. Because if we don't have that beacon on the hill, it's very, it, it's very hard to be purposeful and engaging as a leader because it's like, where are we going and what are we trying to become? Yeah. Um, so, and, and the second thing was uh, that, that I found to be particularly powerful is just, and again, part of it was reading your research just yesterday, was just what development of people does to their loyalty to an organization and their capability of doing their right. work well. Right. Um, and again, you've dedicated your life to it. And I've been the recipient of your wisdom. So. Well, that's very kind. And I've <laughs> learned so much from you and, and Mark Shapiro, too. They're two great individuals, as well as being pretty good doctors, too. <laughs> so anyway, so, Mark, I, I, I think we'll close with uh, your final pay it forward advice. So we speak about how do we lead in a way that engages our people? 
And we have all sorts of leaders and clinicians and all sorts of different folks uh, on the podcast. Uh, and, and if we were to say, um, we wanna lead really well to engage our people, to build our culture and who we are for patients, who we are for each other, um, what's your pay forward advice to be able to get that done in a, in a transformative way to lead well? well? Yeah, you know, one of the things I've learned as an old guy now is if you can center yourself from who you are, overlap with how other people see you. Uh, and you're not trying to be more than you are. And you certainly are, are portraying the fact that you want other people to succeed too, that you want to contribute to the world around you. Uh, but you know, in, in healthcare, as well as in the military, there are a lot of big egos. And, and what I found recently uh, is the less ego you have, the more you can achieve. Uh, and it, and it, it, I once heard a quote that it doesn't matter. Uh, it, sometimes it's amazing what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. Um, but that's an important factor of leadership too. If your team gets the credit, if you shower them with the successes, and as a leader, unfortunately, you take on the failures when there are failures, that's hard to do because we all want to be recognized. But it, it really does something for an organization when you see those kind of leaders giving the credit to others and just feeling like they're part of a team. And that's been kind of the fun part of what I've seen in both my military career and in now in a career, a semi-career in healthcare. I'm sort of in it, sort of on the outside of it, but it's it's fun to see how much you can contribute to other people having unbelievable success. And that's a feel-good moment. When you go home every night and you say, boy, I helped somebody out, that's 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 what leadership is all about. Well, I, I would contend as we as we close that. Uh, you could tell story after story after story about, you know, a senior military commander impacting the lives of young soldiers uh, and, and what that feels like when you put your head on your pillow at the end of a day. Yeah. And, and to add to that, I'll say one more thing. It's, it's what you just said. Those young soldiers, I realized at a certain point in my career, it started at the captain rank when I was about 28 years old. Those young soldiers are always looking at you. And they want to model your behavior. So you've got to give them that example uh, where they continue to do that. And the, the, the higher you go in the, in the command structure or the healthcare industry, the more people are going to be looking at you. A lot of people are looking at the great advice you give and they're saying, I like this guy. I trust him. I want to be just like him. And that's a good thing. That, that's awesome. And, and I'll, I'll give my finally pay, final pay it forward advice because- Nobody asked for it, but here we go. <laughs> so, you know, people ask, you know, how do you build capacity for an organization to accelerate improvement? I would say that my number one guidance is developing clinician as local clinical microsystem team leader. They're not, they're not the formal leadership structure, but the clinical microsystem, the four or five people that do work together is profoundly impacted by the local leadership of a clinician for better or for worse. Right. And, and our ability to see clinicians as team leaders and to provision them the development to lead their teams locally, you are unstoppable. Yeah. And it gives them autonomy, voice, and agency, which are big countermeasures to burnout where I just feel like I'm taking commands all day, every day. So um, anyway, Mark, I am just so grateful for your friendship and your contributions and Thanks. again your faculty position at practicing excellence and and for those of you that don't know what mark is working on we're working on it as we speak he's building a program with us called leading to engage which is designed for all leaders based upon the evidence-based skills that we can deploy at every layer of the organization to bring the best of those that we lead and it's uh, not only that though Stephen, it's also a heck of a lot of fun it is so much fun doing those because I think people will will learn a lot, but they'll also have a good time doing it. Right. And we've gotten a couple of jalapeno margaritas out of the deal. <laughs> exactly right. There's that. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for today. This has Thanks. been fun.
thank you for your service and and thank you for your friendship and uh thank you for being a part of uh this clinical life and uh for the rest of you uh sitting out there we will see you next month we're gonna have a fantastic guest we'll let you know all right everybody have an amazing day thank you very much